Hello YouTube. Today uh, we're going to look at evolutionary psychology, um, a field which is pretty controversial. Uh, it's it's received a, a great deal of sometimes quite unfair criticism, but sometimes uh, very legitimate criticism as well. Uh, but this is one of those subjects that seems to get people's emotions fired up and uh, in, in the next few videos we'll try to evaluate it in a more sober way. So, what is evolutionary psychology? Well, the basic idea is that humans are products of evolution. In particular, our brains and our minds are products of evolution, so we can apply modern evolutionary theory to problems within psychology. A standard example here is incest avoidance. Most people find the idea of incest deeply repulsive, but incest in itself doesn't appear to hurt anybody. Um, if your attractive sister wants to have sex with you and you're both adults, why not go for it? Sex is fun and everybody's consenting, so what's the big deal? Why are you disgusted by this idea? Well, there's a fairly obvious explanation that appeals to evolutionary history. Children born of incest between close relatives are much more likely to have uh, debilitating, often lethal, genetic diseases. So organisms that engage in incest will have fewer offspring, and the offspring they uh, do have will be much weaker than organisms that seek unrelated mates. It's of great adaptive value to look for mates outside the family, and that's why today we have such strong reactions to incest. It's simply that ancestral humans who weren't disgusted by incest didn't have as many descendants, so we have this innate biological uh, reaction of, of disgust. Um, okay, that, that's a, a simple example of applying evolutionary ideas to psychology. Uh, probably doesn't seem very controversial. Well, many people distinguish evolutionary psychology in a, a general sense to refer to the appeal to evolutionary ideas in psychology from evolutionary psychology with capital letters as a, a paradigm, a well-defined research tradition with specific theories about the nature of the mind and specific approaches to methodology. Now, we'll be looking at the latter. Um, I don't think anybody denies that psychologists can appeal to evolutionary ideas, sometimes in fruitful ways. The debate is really more about this specific theory. Um, so evolutionary psychology as a well-defined theory was pioneered by uh, Leda Cosme Cosmides and John Tooby. Uh, and I think this theory really has five central claims. First, we have the idea that evolutionary theory can integrate essentially all of psychology and give it a proper scientific foundation. You may be familiar with this famous quote by Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. The theory of evolution utterly transformed every single field of biology, uh, zoology, taxonomy, physiology, paleontology, genetics, molecular biology. All of these fields are infused with all with, with evolutionary theory and evolutionary theory is really what unites all of these fields evolution is the the foundation for all of biological science similarly cosmides and to behold that since the human mind is a product of biology evolution should be the foundation for all psychology and that will involve some pretty major changes since most psychologists currently don't pay much attention to evolution so I hope you can start to see why evolutionary psychology has been controversial. The claim is not simply that psychologists can appeal to evolutionary theory. The claim is that evolution should be absolutely central in all fields of psychology. Whenever we do psychology, we should be paying attention to evolution. And if we ignore evolution, our theories and methods of research will be completely inadequate. Evolution is mandatory, just like it is in biology. Imagine a biologist ignoring evolution. His ideas would, would never get off the ground. Okay, the next four claims uh, concern uh, ways in which a focus on evolution will transform the psychological sciences. So, so second, traditionally we tend to see the mind as a kind of general purpose system. It's composed of a few very general capacities that we apply in different ways. A good example is rationality or reasoning. You apply your capacity for reasoning to diverse tasks, such as tracking a deer, working out problems in high-level mathematics, preparing a meal, engaging in arguments about politics, or identifying why your car won't start. 
Underlying all of these different tasks, we have a, a very general mechanism for making inferences and forming beliefs. Similarly, we might suppose we have a general purpose capacity for learning. Whether we're learning a language or learning how to cook or practicing a musical instrument, we have a general learning system that allows us to uh, learn all of these things. According to evolutionary psychology, this view is completely mistaken. So uh, once, once we take an evolutionary view of the mind, we see that it can have few, if any, general purpose capacities. Uh, instead, we should expect it to be composed of a variety of uh, disparate, highly specialised modules that perform uh, very specific functions. Cosmides and Tooby suggest that the mind may be composed of literally thousands of highly specialised modules. Um, this is known as the massive modularity hypothesis, because it claims that the structure of the mind is modular through and through. There are many people who think the mind may be partially modular. That's modest modularity. But evolutionary psychology proposes massive modularity. According to evolutionary psychology, it's unlikely that there are any general purpose mechanisms whatsoever. Um, so why? why? Why is this? Well, when we look at organisms in their evolutionary development, we find that natural selection tends to produce structures that perform specific functions. For instance, the eyes provide visual information about the world. Hands can be used for grabbing things, manipulating things, feeling textures. Teeth are for grinding down food. In fact, teeth are very highly specialised since they're differentiated into incisors, molars, canines, and these uh, are for different things. But uh, te teeth can't do what eyes can do, and eyes can't do what teeth can do. I suppose you could sometimes substitute teeth for hands, since you could uh, use teeth to grab things, but that wouldn't be very effective. The point is that if you look at an organism, you'll find it's composed of uh, a variety of very highly specialised modules, uh, structures which evolved in response to specific demands and which perform specific functions. Now there are essentially s sort of three reasons for this kind of specialisation. First of all, natural selection has no foresight. It can only build adaptations in response to the specific problems that organisms encounter at particular times. Imagine a predator that crushes its prey. So it has a specialised mechanism for crushing. It can move its muscles in special ways to apply pressure, like a python. Well, we can imagine that its prey evolves a resistance to the crushing force. Maybe the prey evolves very tough shells. And stabbing the shells to crack them would be more efficient than crushing. It, it might be useful for the predator to have a mechanism that can both crush and stab. But obviously, it's not going to have this if there was no need for stabbing in its past. I mean, it might evolve stabbing in the future, but right now, uh, it, 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 but in, if crushing was sufficient in the past, it's only going to have a crushing mechanism. Second, uh, even if natural selection did have foresight, it's, it's often simply a lot quicker to develop a specialised system than a general purpose one. General purpose mechanisms are much more complex, just because they have to deal with many more problems. What would a mechanism that can both stab and crush look like? There are certainly things that can do that, but they're more complex than uh, stabbing alone or crushing alone. Uh, stabbing just involves moving a sharp object. With crushing, you just apply force with your muscles. Um, if you want to combine them, that's going to be a more complex mechanism. And obviously, a mechanism that builds in even more things will be even more complex. Finally, and most importantly, a general purpose mechanism would be less effective at solving the problem. A mechanism that specialises in crushing is probably going to be a better crusher than a mechanism that can both crush and stab. Similarly, imagine trying to replace the heart and kidneys and liver and so on with a general purpose organ that does all of those tasks. Specialised organs are, are faster, they're more reliable, they're more, more efficient, simply because in order for an organ to do a huge variety of tasks, it would have to make compromises on each task. Uh, a jack of all trades is a master of none. In the context of psychology, this problem is significantly compounded for uh, several reasons. I'll um, mention just two. First of all, if you want to find your way around the world efficiently, you have to learn how to avoid making errors. And in order for you to learn how to avoid making errors, 
you need to know exactly what counts as an error. You need to have some sort of standard or criteria by which you can judge how effective your actions have been. Now the problem is that what counts as an error, what reduces fitness, differs from domain to domain. There is dom no domain independent standard of error. Cosmides and Tooby give the examples. In the sexual domain, error equals sex with kin. In the helping domain, error equals not a helping kin given the appropriate envelope of circumstances. In cooperative exchanges, error equals being cheated, which is paying a cost without receiving the benefit to which this entitles you. Imagine that a, a domain general learning mechanism figured out that the individual shouldn't have sex with close relatives. Uh, it's not actually obvious that a domain general learning mechanism could do this, since um, it, it often takes time for the drawbacks of incest to become obvious. I mean, after all, ma many babies born of incest don't have any obvious problems. Um, but let's say it figures out not to have sex with its kin. Well, okay, but how do we prevent overgeneralization? How do we make sure that the rule is specific to its appropriate domain? How do we prevent rules such as avoid any interaction with kin, or avoid touching kin, which would obviously be maladaptive? It's, it's not obvious how to prevent a domain general mechanism from making these kind of faulty generalizations. Uh, second, combinatorial explosion. Take any problem. Let's say you've uh, moved to a new environment and you need to find food. Question, what should you do? Well, if you consider all of the options that are available to you, there's uh, an enormous and explosive amount of actions you can take. Most of them are very silly and wouldn't help you at all, such as twirl around in a circle for five minutes and then go to sleep, or uh, try to jump up to the moon. Of course, whenever we're faced with a problem, we never actually evaluate all of the alternatives. Uh, we don't even consider the vast majority of possible actions. But since a domain general system lacks specific knowledge, it lacks specific rules of relevance, it lacks specific procedures, how can it zero in on the relevant alternatives and ignore the silly ones? This problem is solved very easily if we suppose, with Cosmodes and Tubi, that when faced with um, a problem, a domain-specific module is activated, and this brings with it specific knowledge and procedures. Um, and again, re regarding the earlier problem about um, learning and standards of error, if we suppose that we have lots of domain-specific psychological modules, they can just be have their own uh, specific standards of error written into them. Uh, so, uh, the Cosmodes and Tubi conclude that there, there is no domain general reasoning capacity, no domain uh, general learning capacity. We, we don't have these sort of general purpose capacities. Instead, specific modules developed for different domains. We have one mod module for dealing with hunting, another for persuading others, another for planning for the future. Steven Pinker suggests the following kinds of modules. Uh, intuitive mechanics, which is a, a module that gives us a certain picture of cause and effect, of motion, of the way that forces act on objects, of uh, different ways objects can be manipulated. A module for contamination, which is an intuitive understanding of what's associated with infection and disease. A module for intuitive psychology, uh, sometimes called folk psychology, with the ability to uh, understand other people's minds, to empathise with them, to explain and predict their behaviour. A module for, mate, uh, for reproduction and mate selection, what sort of things to look for in mates. A module for habitat selection, so knowing how to find the, the best kind of places to live a module for morality and justice, so our sense of duties and obligations, rights, fairness, and so on. Um, obviously, uh, these modules are innate. They're part of our biology. Given a reasonably normal environment, they will develop without any kind of formal instruction. So the idea is that we are born into the world with a great deal of knowledge already written into our minds, um, a great deal of uh, kind of un understanding and capabilities and abilities already there in our heads that we'll develop without any kind of um, formal training. Aside from the more general arguments claiming that natural selection produces massive modularity, evolutionary psychologists have tried to produce empirical evidence for this claim. Um, the most famous example concerns the Waysen selection task. The Waysen selection task is uh, a simple logic puzzle. Here are 
four cards. Each card has a number on one side and a patch of colour on the other. Uh, consider this rule. If a card has an even number on one side, the opposite side will be blue. The question is, which of these four cards do you have to turn over in order to test whether or not this is correct, whether or not this rule holds? How do we make sure that none of the cards break the rule? So pause the video and have a think about it. OK, I hope you've done that. The correct answer is that you need to turn over these two, the four card and the red card. Uh, you probably got it wrong. Don't feel too bad. The vast majority of people get it wrong. Humans are very bad at this task, despite its apparent simplicity. So why is this the right answer? Well, the rule says, if a card has an even number on one side, then the opposite side will be blue. Card 1 has the number 4. We need to turn this over. If this uh, card is red or green or whatever on, on the other side, then the rule is broken, since we'd have an even number but no blue. Card 2 has the number 9. We don't need to see what's on the other side of this. Uh, this is an odd number, so not relevant to the rule. Card 3. Uh, we need to turn this over, because there might be an even number on the other side, and then we'd have even with red, which would break the rule. I think most people tend to trip up on card 4. We don't need to turn this one over. Why? Well, it's already blue, so we know that the rule is upheld. What the rule says is that all even-numbered cards must be blue. It doesn't say that all blue cards must be even. So this might be this might have an even number on the other side, or it might have an odd number. Either way, it doesn't need, it doesn't break the rule, so we don't need to check it. There are many versions of the waste and selection task. This stuff about numbers and colours is very abstract, but we can run the waste and selection selection task with more practical social rules. So think about this rule: if a child hasn't eaten their vegetables, they can't have any pudding. Now you're told, William has eaten his vegetables, Patrick has not eaten his vegetables, John has eaten pudding, Tom has not eaten pudding. So, which of these children do we have to investigate in order to make sure that none of them have broken this rule? Well, what's interesting is that in this case, the vast majority of people get the answer right. Uh, we have to check Patrick and John. Um, most people know immediately that we don't have to check Tom because he's not eaten any pudding anyway. Um, so it doesn't matter whether or not he's had any vegetables. Tom is like the blue card. It, it doesn't matter what's on the other side. And this is kind of obvious immediately. So there's a striking difference between how we perform on these two seemingly very similar problems. Now in general, when waste and selection tasks are given in terms of more abstract logical problems, people do badly. But when they're given as, uh, in terms of sort of social rules, practical rules, people do very well. Now, uh, Cosmides suggests that what's going on here is that we've evolved a cheater detection module. We have a module that makes us sensitive to cheaters, to those who try to get benefits without doing the appropriate work, or without being a member of the appropriate class. Now, there are obvious evolutionary benefits to having this kind of module. It's hugely beneficial to live in an altruistic society where people help each other, but this only works as long as everybody's willing to help everyone else. If you uh, don't have the ability to detect and punish cheaters, then the, uh, the, the free riders will swamp the altruists. So we develop mechanisms for reliably detecting cheaters. In contrast, there's no evolved module for dealing with abstract problems concerning numbers and shapes. Uh, Cosmides did a number of studies with different versions of the waste and selection task to test this hypothesis. I'll mention just two. Consider the proposition if a man eats cassava root, he has a tattoo on his face. And you're shown four cards. One side has a statement about whether the person has eaten cassava root. The other has a statement about whether or not they have a tattoo. Uh, William eats cassava root. Patrick does not eat cassava root. John has a tattoo on his face. Tom does not have a tattoo on his face. Which of these do you have to turn over, as it were, to test the proposition? Well, so, so with this one, people perform very badly, um, as with the standard waste and selection task. Um, since you've seen a couple of these now, you might know that the answers are William and Tom. Cosmides gave uh, exactly the same task to another set of participants, but this time she also gave them a background story. Um, now, the story goes something like this. In this society, 
cassava root is considered to be a very powerful aphrodisiac and you're only permitted to eat cassava root if you're married. Uh, they don't want unmarried men eating it because that might lead to um, dirty and perverted behaviour. Uh, furthermore, in this society, when men are married, they get facial tattoos. So having a tattoo on your face means you're married. Now, consider our proposition. If a man eats cassava root, he has a tattoo on his face. Well, then, it, that, that, then that becomes a social contract rule. Now, when you present the task in this way, the majority of people get it right. We know that we have to check William and Tom. We know that what we have to do in order to detect cheaters. So this seems to confirm uh, Cosmides' hypothesis. that These two tasks are exactly the same. It's just that in the second case, we're looking at it as a social rule. What all of this seems to show is that we don't have a general purpose capacity for reasoning. We're only good at reasoning in certain specific circumstances, such as circumstances where we have to detect cheaters. When we're given a scenario involving a rule, involving some action you're obligated to take before you can receive the benefits, this activates our cheater detection module and we're very good at spotting people who might be cheating. It's worth noting that um, in order for any robust program of evolutionary psychology to get off the ground, it's pretty much essential that the mind is massively modular, or at least that significantly parts of it, significant parts of it are modular. And the reason is simple. Suppose that the mind has uh, no specialised modules, instead it consists of a few very general mechanisms that can deal with all sorts of circumstances. You, know, you have a general purpose reasoning mechanism, general purpose emotion mechanism, just a few of these. Well, in this case, evolution doesn't, it, it couldn't make much of a contribution to explaining our behaviour. Our behaviour would largely be a product of our culture. Um, our reasoning abilities in, in, in different contexts, our emotional responses to things, merely reflect our upbringing, how we've been taught, and they don't tell us anything about our evolutionary history. Um, that's if it's general purpose. So massive modularity is an extremely important idea for evolutionary psychology. If the mind is massively modular, then of course evolution can, um, can, can sort of influence specific modules and that can help to explain our behaviour. The third claim of evolutionary psychology is that these modules evolved tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago during a Pleistocene hunter-gatherer life. The reason is that there simply hasn't been enough time since then for substantial evolution to occur. The Neolithic Revolution, when humans developed agriculture, occurred around 10,000 BC. Um, and before this, we were hunter-gatherers for our entire history. Now, 12,000 years is an extremely short period of time in geological time, in, in geological terms. Um, our brains haven't changed much in that time. So the slogan is that we, we're living in a, a modern world, but with Stone Age brains. We have Stone Age minds. The obvious consequence is that if we want to do psychology, if we want to understand the workings of the mind, we have to consider the Pleistocene background. We have to ask, what sort of psychological mechanisms would have promoted fitness during the Pleistocene? I think this is a relatively simple idea. The technical term that evolutionary psychologists use is the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. This just means the environment in which a particular feature evolved. When we try to understand a feature, we have to consider its environment of evolutionary adaptedness, its environment in which it evolved. Um, now, obviously, there is no single environment in which, we evolve, in which we evolved. So the environment of evolutionary adaptedness is a sort of abstraction that takes the average of uh, a variety of times and places. But very broadly speaking, the human mind evolved in Pleistocene hunter-gatherer societies. So Pleistocene hunter-gatherer society is the environment of evolutionary adaptedness for the human mind. Fourth, the collection of modules is universal. It's shared by all human populations and so constitutes an invariant human nature. Uh, all populations of humans have the same innate cognitive structures. There are several points in favour of this idea. First, there's a simple analogy. We know that the structure of the body is basically universal. Um, I mean, there are bodily differences between different populations, but these tend to be very minor. There are no functionally complex bodily adaptations that some human populations have, but that others lack. So similarly, we should expect, according to evolutionary psychologists, that 
complex cognitive adaptations are universal. Second, when we look at human evolution, we see that human populations are very closely related. One view of human evolution that is completely discredited today is the theory that uh, the ancestors of humans left Africa about two million years ago and then evolved largely separately on, on the different continents. This is one version of what's called the multi-regional model. Um, and this long time combined with separate evolution uh, will give rise to significant differences. These days, the mainstream view is uh, called the recent African origins model, which holds that humans emerged relatively recently in Africa, only about 100,000 or 200,000 years ago, and then migrated out across the globe um, re very recently. There's still some debate about human origins, um, and there are more plausible versions of, of the multi-regional model that some people still defend. But all of the plausible models have it that humans, are, human populations are very closely related. Third, uh, and most importantly, complex adaptations require tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of genes to work together. But reproduction involves genetic recombination. The genomes of the parents get shuffled around you have some of your dad's genes and some of your mum's genes. So if human populations had different cognitive modules, and these, module, these modules would be broken down when the populations interbreed, which means we'd expect to find that mixed race children are significantly less intelligent, significantly less capable, less able to work their way around the world than purebred children. But we know that that's not the case. Um, and in fact, I mean, we're all mixed race to a very great degree since human populations are extremely promiscuous and we're constantly interbreeding with each other all the time. Cognitive modules are maintained through interbreeding of different populations. And this shows that the sets of genes coding for those cognitive modules must be shared by all populations. Um, now, with that said, with all that said, you may have noticed an immediate problem here, which is cultural diversity. There is an enormous variety of cultures in the world. Uh, different cultures have very different social structures, different moral systems, different myths and religions, different uh, kinds of technology, and so on. And that seems kind of difficult to reconcile with this idea of a, a universal human nature. Well, evolutionary psychologists generally make two points here. First, um, diversity is overstated. There are many uh, arguments that when we actually examine different cultures more closely, we find similar patterns of behaviour emerging. For instance, uh, there might be similar kinds of relations between the sexes. The vast majority of cultures are either, either monogamous or polygynous, which means one man having many wives. Um, polyandry, which is one woman with many husbands, is extraordinarily rare. There are a few examples in India, um, for instance among the Toda people of the Nilgiri district, uh, where the woman marries all the brothers of a family, but those kinds of cases are very, very rare. Now we might suppose that this very high frequency of monogamy and polygyny, and the very low frequency of polyandry, reflects something important about the relations between the sexes. Although there is diversity, I mean some, some cultures are monogamous, some are polygynous, um, we might suppose that there is a kind of underlying unity to, um, to these differences. Second, and this is very important, the same psychological mechanism will produce different behaviour given different inputs. An obvious example is a mechanism coding for a kind of tit-for-tat strategy of behaviour. So this might be a rule that says, if a person helps you, you help them back. If a person hurts you or refuses to help you, you hurt them or refuse to hurt, help them. Um, treat others as they treat you, basically. Uh, giving this strategy different inputs could produce very different behaviours. In one environment, this will create a person who is very helpful and altruistic, but in a more hostile environment, we'd get a person who's uh, aggressive and violent and surly. So when evolutionary psychologists propose psychological uh, modules, they will either try to focus on behaviours that are universal, or they'll look for modules that give uh, kind of different outputs and so are compatible with diversity. Uh, there is one very important exception to the claim of universality, and this is sex differences. We know that there is notable sexual dimorphism of bodily traits. Women have breasts, men don't. Women and men have a different waist-hip ratio. Women are smaller than men, and so on. 
most evolutionary psychologists um, also hold that there is notable dimorphism in our psychological modules. This has been one of the more controversial aspects of evolutionary psychology. There's uh, been a lot of accusations of um, sexism and conservatism. Um, but a uh, classic example of this kind of work has been on uh, different reproductive strategies, different strategies used to secure mates. Much of this comes from David Buss. Um, there are big and important differences between men and women as far as reproduction is concerned. Men don't really have to put much effort into reproduction, at least biologically speaking. All that's necessary is that they have sex. That's it. Now, for women, reproduction comes with very heavy costs. Pregnancy takes a lot of time. It uses up a lot of effort and energy, and it carries pretty significant risks. Um, the risks are fairly minor these days because we have advanced medical technology. But before antibiotics, I think about one in ten women uh, died from puerperal fever, a bacterial infection following childbirth. So immediately we can hypothesize that men and women are going to have quite different uh, reproductive strategies. In particular, we can expect men to be less choosy and more inclined to engage in promiscuous sex. Uh, if a man impregnates a substandard partner, he hasn't lost anything. If a woman is impregnated by a substandard partner, that's a serious cost to her fitness. And um, I think this is probably in line with what people would expect. Uh, it does seem like men are less choosy and more inclined to promiscuity than women. So Buss examines these kinds of differences a bit further. Uh, he considers differences in expressions of jealousy about infidelity. One challenge faced by men but not by women is uncertainty of paternity. If a woman is pregnant, she knows that the child is hers. It can't belong to another woman. But if a man's partner is pregnant, the child might not be his. In humans, uh, this will impose a very significant reproductive cost on the male, since males in human societies are expected to invest time and energy into their partners and their children. So if a man's partner has been unfaithful, uh, then he will be using his resources to rear another man's children. We can expect that there will have been very strong selection on males to defend against cuckoldry. Men who didn't care about sexual infidelity will have had less offspring than men who were motivated to prevent it. Now, of course, infidelity can also be a problem for women. Uh, for women, there's no danger that they might, they might end up with another woman's child. But there is a danger that their partner might invest his time and resources in another woman. So there will have been selection on women to protect their fair share of resources from their men. Women who didn't care if their partners invested time and energy in other women will have been less able to rear offspring than women who actively prevented this. So both men and women will be motivated to protect their mating relationships, and this accounts for why we feel jealousy and why we feel so negative about infidelity. But infidelity poses different problems for each sex, so we might expect there to be differences in how each sex reacts to it. Now, Buss suggests that males are cued to respond more strongly to sexual infidelity because males need to protect against cuckoldry. They primarily need to make sure that women aren't having sex with other men. On the other hand, females are cued to respond more strongly to emotional infidelity. If a man is emotionally invested in another person, then he's likely to divert his time and resources to that other person. So each sex has different psychological modules for dealing with infidelity. To test this, Buss gave people in various countries infidelity dilemmas, which work like this. You're asked to consider being in a, a long-term romantic relationship, and then you discover that your partner has become involved with another person. Which would distress you more? So the first dilemma. Uh, a, imagining your partner forming a deep emotional attachment to that person, and obviously this is emotional infidelity. Uh, or B, imagining your partner enjoying passionate sexual intercourse with that other person, which is sexual infidelity. Uh, two, a, imagining your partner trying different sexual positions with that other person, or B, imagining your partner falling in love with that other person. Um, now, as you can see from the results here, um, men are far more likely to find sexual infidelity more distressing than women. Some of the results are actually quite striking. I mean, in one of the study of the, the US participants, 73%, you've got 73% versus only 4%, uh, which is a pretty extreme case, but this kind of... Um, pattern holds in every 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 study, literally every single one. Um, it's not always quite so extreme, the difference, but you can see that 
it always men find sexual infidelity are more likely to choose it than, than women. So um, another example of sex differences is mate preferences. Um, uh, men and women will have evolved different cognitive modules for finding mates, so Buss suggests. The reason is simple. Um, women's ability to have children declines with age, and some women are more able to carry healthy children than others, so men are likely to look for features like youth and indicators of fertility. You know, they're going to want women who are like 18 years old with a particular waist-hip ratio. On the other hand, women don't really need to care about the biological status of a man. Men are able to continue having children for their whole lives. Uh, it doesn't really matter what a man looks like, as long as he doesn't have any serious genetic diseases, he'll be able to produce healthy children. So what they tend to look for are resources. Women need men who can provide for them and their children. So women are likely to look for men who are in a good economic position, with good social status, personality traits like loyalty, dependability, emotional stability, ambition, and so on. So those are just a couple of examples of um, proposed sex differences. Um, it's not diff 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 difficult to find more research about this. As I mentioned, this is one of the topics that's generated a lot of controversy uh, for evolutionary psychology. There are evolutionary psychologists who've suggested that there might be very substantial cognitive differences between men and women, that, and, and that these differences account for current social structures. For instance, the fact that there are many more men than women in positions of power in politics, or that many more men tend to rise to the top in mathematics and sciences. Um, some evolutionary psychologists have suggested that these kinds of differences have a biological basis and that is obviously uh, a very controversial thing to claim. People who are more inclined to feminist approaches are going to have a lot of problems with that um, but we'll look at those criticisms uh, in more detail in the next video. Um, but so, so you can see, um, but the point is uh, so far then we have the claim that um, the mind is massively modular um, it's composed of thousands of distinct modules uh, which are innate and which you know, we're, we're born into the world with a lot of innate kind of knowledge and innate capacities. Um, we have the claim that these modules evolved during Pleistocene hunter-gatherer life and that these modules are universal. They represent a, a universal human nature with the exception of sex differences. The fifth claim of evolutionary psychology concerns methodology. How should research in psychology be conducted? And essentially it's based on uh, reverse engineering the mind. We identify a particular uh, psychological trait or, or module and then we ask what sort of adaptive problems might our hunter-gatherer ancestors have faced that this trait could have solved. Or we consider adaptive problems and then hypothesize what sort of modules might have solved them. Uh, the cheetah detection module hypothesis is an example of this. So there are basically three steps um, in this kind of uh, research. First of all, we identify an adaptive problem that would have been universally present in Pleistocene life. Uh, second, we hypothesize a psychological module that could solve this problem. And third, we test for the existence of the module. So uh, uh, Cosmides had identified an adaptive problem in uh, cheetahs. Uh, we we want to. It's good for everyone to maintain an altruistic society, but cheetahs are going to um, uh, could, could end up swamping the altruists. We don't want people to get away without doing their fair share. So she hypothesised a cheetah detection module uh, that could help us detect cheetahs and stop them. And then we tested for them by um, designing different kinds of waste and selection tasks. That's a classic example of. Uh, research of in evolutionary psychology. So, um, I mean, the idea is that we should approach the mind much like an evolutionary biologist approaches the body. We, we situate the mind in the context of adaptive problems facing our ancestors, and then think about what mechanisms could have solved these problems. Right, so those are the foundations of evolutionary psychology. Uh, I uh, hope that was all reasonably clear. In the next video, we will examine um, uh, some of the some of the criticisms of it. Um, but that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.